Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 635. This is 635 of the Agostino Zynga show and I hope you're doing well wherever this bloody podcast may find you. I hope you are doing dandy. I hope you are doing good. It is the first or no, the second day of the month actually as you're going to be listening to this. I'm recording it on the first but it is the second day of the new year. So happy new year to all my listeners wherever you may be. I hope you had a good New Year's Eve, hope you had a good New Year's Day and I hope you are attacking this new 2020-23 year, 2020-23 year with haste. I said it twice there because I thought I said it wrong the first time. Don't watch that. Don't watch that. And I've managed, if you're not listening to this or watching it via YouTube, I've also managed not to curse in the first eight seconds, which is good. If you've been keeping an eye on what's been happening on YouTube, we would have known loads of really big time YouTubers are really getting their knickers in a twist about this whole like eight seconds um, swearing thing. Mostly because I think like, these little changes that YouTube makes in policy, where essentially if you swear within the first eight seconds of a video, you essentially run the risk of your videos getting demonetized. A lot of big YouTubers with like thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of subscribers are getting some of their content or some of their video library like retroactively demonetized. And a lot of that stuff is evergreen stuff. Some of it, not all of it, but some of it evergreen stuff where, you know, people are watching it throughout the years and not necessarily when it came out. It doesn't just stop and you know, stop kind of hitting the algorithms. So a lot of that stuff is kind of good little extra money on top of the stuff that you're doing that's going viral. So you can imagine the impact that people is having on people's pockets, especially if they are, you know, full time YouTubers and this is their career. And I guess those little changes they make as per usual, like, you know, similar with government stuff. When it comes to little legislations, little policy changes, um, bureaucratic red tape types things, it's usually the small things that are usually a precursor for big sweeping changes coming in. So if you don't kick up a fuss and really say something about the little changes, then when the big changes come along, it's too late by that point. So I can understand why everybody's doing it. So I've kind of gone out of my way to not swear, not curse, and I'm feeling good. And I want a little sticker and I want a cookie. So thank you very much. But yeah, New Year's here, 2023. Um, not gonna lie, it doesn't feel any different. I think the older you get, the the less the new years really kind of affect you in terms of feeling like a different year. Like, oh my god, this year's my year. But if anything, one of the good things about New Year's, I guess similar to me on Mondays, which is quite handy because the second day of the week is on a Monday. But I always loved Mondays because it gave me a chance to sort of reset. And when I was really going out and I was really getting on it and I was really going crazy, it was always a good time to sort of get back to what I would be doing if I wasn't going crazy and I wasn't getting on it. So that would mean reading, that would mean learning a new language, that would mean writing, that would mean running, that would mean working out, all that good stuff that I'd feel you know, kind of adds to my life and doesn't necessarily um, corrupt my brain cells in any kind of way. I could start getting the money despite of, you know, what I got up to from fr- Friday to Sunday or further to Sunday. It was always that good, great of a chance. So I feel like New Year's Eve or New Year's Day or the New Year in general is a good chance to kind of, you know, figure some stuff out. Maybe even not even having lists like New Year's resolutions that I have because I'm a little bit of a, you know, addict for goals and ticking off things on lists and whatnot and being a little bit more um, rudimentary, yeah, rudimentary and kind of rigid in my kind of approach in life sometimes. I can be loose, but sometimes I do kind of love things to be in order and to have lists and whatnot I want to kind of tick off in a year. But one thing that could be really handy is just sort of like overarching questions that you want answered in a year, overarching themes that maybe you want to address maybe whatever it may be uh, even overarching emotional states uh mental states uh relationships friendships whatever it may be there might be some big questions that you need to kind of really ask yourself and use it in new year's a good time to sort of address those things um or you can just not do nothing <laughs> which i've never known to do and i think that maybe came maybe a church thing maybe because of all those years i spent in church that usually you know a, a lot of the grift a lot of the kind of opportunity to make a lot of money for your preacher would be around christmas would be around new year's because you could basically you know especially the the, the preaching um style of like prosper is it prosperity preaching or something like that right where you essentially you're telling people hey if you put five pound in this offering basket and you pray over it it's going to multiply it's going to come back to you you know 10 times x in this way that way whatever it may be and a good time to hit people is generally you know especially people in like poverty ridden areas like i was and how i grew up you hit them around christmas you hit them around new years and then people really go loose and think that those things are really going to make big changes so maybe that's why i kind of got my 
obsession and love for like new year's eve or new year's resolutions in general because i kind of started getting into all that whole self-actualization you know woohoo um self-help stuff really later on in life but i think my early kind of taste of that was definitely through like preachers and pastors in church coming in with books and saying hey if you read this book this is definitely going to change your life no and then they come back the next year no this is the book that's going to change your life then they come back the next year no this book and then i remember i started to notice a grift where they weren't even coming back the next year they'd come back a couple of months later and pedal another book another online program another master class which is basically another program another ebook which is basically another book like just loads of nonsense until it got to a point of like okay cool enough's enough like you guys keep coming here in more exotic foreign cars with more shiny um really obtuse and gaudy watches while i'm coming here sat in the back of a voxel my dad's voxel corsa like we know a family of five imagine all of us fitting into a flipping free door voxel corsa going to church while these guys guys are basically asking us to put money into the offering basket like ask you know we need practical help how do we get out of this little car into a bigger car how do we leave a you know um what do you call it a bed bug ridden house into a house that has doesn't have some how do we go to a house that doesn't, doesn't have a concrete garden or has a grass like give us some practical tips instead of this nonsense but again one thing i can pull for me because i like to see where you see the you know the, the positives and some of the negatives was that i am quite goal orientated goal orientated sorry and it has served me quite well considering how crazy my lifestyle can get outside of all this stuff so when i go dark when i have my kind of you know lack of a better term which is basically a crash job when i have my theophilus london moment where i just disappear it's usually because i'm going crazy and hitting the clubs and stuff but then when i'm back on tune and i'm back in line i'm back in line uh, but which is quite good because i don't have that kind of i also don't have that sort of um uh, what's that thing called? I'm not kind of convinced myself in my head. You know that? I think if you watch a video of like Burt Kreischer trying to um, basically argue that he's not an alcoholic or anyone that would argue they're not an alcoholic, but she, you know, we've all got friends in our social group who go out way too often and drink too much. And usually there's this weird self speak that they have where they kind of trying to convince themselves they don't have an issue. And um, it's usually very telling because, you know, they're basically trying to explain away the fact that they drink themselves to bed. Whereas I have these little spurts where I kind of go crazy. And for the most part, you know, at home, I don't really have booze. Um, I don't necessarily, you know, like going to the pub on a Friday after work to kind of, you know, um, tap out and zone out. All those little things I really apply. They mostly apply to nightclubs and get on it. And of course, I don't do that all the time. So it's not really an issue in that regard. So that's been pretty decent. But again, New Year, we start and we go. So I decided to put together some new resolutions for the new year, 2023, and I want to share them with you because I think this is a good chance to be accountable and just to kind of get it out there so you guys can have an idea on what I'm basically looking at and what I'm trying to do going forward. And this is kind of my overall kind of thing that I'm kind of, you know, basing the early parts of the year to like this is kind of a rough three to six month kind of um guardrail to kind of give me some good structure going into a new year and again some things might fall by the wayside but this kind of gives me an easy um rec an easy recommended dose that i can take that can i can get off because a lot of this stuff is like stuff that's in my control, stuff that isn't my control, but stuff that I can easily just action off before 12 a.m. in the morning or 12 p.m. So in the afternoon. So this is my New Year's Eve, sorry, New Year's resolution for 2023. Number one, read 100 books. Number two, get 50,000 subscribers on YouTube. Number three, run 20 miles per week. Number four, maintain a weight of 200 pounds all year number five we'll do one hour of language learning per day and number six write and publish one blog post per day which is obviously starting on a monday so if you haven't watched it already you, you definitely see some of this already so number one reading 100 books a day 100 books a day for the year i know this sounds a bit nuts but always you know you need to understand that I already find reading quite an easy anyway, so it's not that much of an issue. At my peak, which was maybe a few years ago, might have been three years ago, I was reading four books a month. At this pace, I think I'd need to get through about eight, I think a month to kind of make this work, if I'm not mistaken. Let me just double check. I think I calculated the other day. Let me just see. Eight uh, times 12. Whoops. Yeah, so basically more than that, maybe 10. Oof. Is it 10? No, it's not. It'd be nine. So maybe about eight, maybe about eight and a bit. 
maybe it ain't a bit and I might cheat at the end of it and just bang out a couple of flipping short pamphlet books to kind of get it over the line but I was already reading four so I just got to double it and read eight plus maybe a few more at the end of the month so it's not at the end of the year so it's not too bad like I said I've already got a good base of reading it's also not like I'm coming into this completely blank I was reading you know 50 you know four books a month for a serious stretch of time i'm thinking like five years consecutively so it's not that big of a deal in that regard the fifty thousand subscribers on youtube i also think it's a bit of a stretch goal it's a bit out there but i think i can do it at the moment i speak to you right now at the beginning of the year um sunday the 1st of january 2023 i'm currently sitting on if i check my youtube studio i'm currently sitting on 17,230 subscribers which is a far distance away from 50 but still a general kind of thing that i can kind of achieve the run 20 miles per week is going to be difficult on my current weight because obviously running when you're a bit bigger is always hard but i also have done this prior i think my consistent mileage per week when i was really running a lot was around 16 to 20 miles per week i was doing on a consistent basis i also cheated a little bit because at that time this was pre-pandemic maybe 2018 ish around that time i think you can probably find me on strava and see some of that data but around that time i was also working in like you know central london and stuff so that afforded me the opportunity every sometimes every friday every wednesday i'd run home from work which is basically you know maybe eight miles or so maybe six eight maybe six to eight miles which obviously is a good way to kind of get loads of managing in a week without having to go run you know um have do loads of runs to make up that 20 miles a week so now i don't have that that cheat i'm gonna have to go out more often so i may have to go out like three to four times or maybe five to run to kind of get that mileage and or just do one big one i don't really know to maintain 200 pounds a year is definitely something that i want to kind of re this is one of my biggest goals because i think i've shown you many times on here i've dropped weight many many times i've kind of gone up and down yo-yoed a lot like oprah and but I've never really maintained it for a long time. I think the longest I've maybe maintained it was maybe been four months or so in terms of a solid amount, like, you know, consistently back to back. And obviously maintaining it, I feel like is a lot harder also than losing it because maintaining it also means I'm going to have to make some healthy lifestyle choices. I'm going to have to maybe avoid partying as much as I would like, avoid getting on it as much as I like to kind of maintain that level because a lot of the stuff that would lead me to making room correct decisions would be tied to the fact that I would kind of be you know waking up hungover and whatnot and ordering uber eats and all that sort of malarkey that would obviously not help the whole working out vibe because you know if you're working out monday to friday you're going out and then you're eating crap on the weekends it kind of negates a lot of work you did in the week especially if you're doing it every single weekend so that's something i'm definitely looking forward to the one like one hour language learning is definitely something i'm also really looking forward to this is going to be most likely going to be spanish um that i'm going to be doing because i've got a decent base in that already and then obviously I'll probably sprinkling some french as well because i've got you know i used to speak that when i was a kid but unfortunately i lost it in an effort to kind of fit into this blood clot country and not get bullied but i also you know i'm sure once i start learning it or reactivate by flipping french speaking gene so that should be good and write and publish one blog post per day so this is what i'll be using to kind of do my one blog post per day so i'm looking forward to doing that and this is mostly just to kind of get a lot of the stuff that i think about on record i'm uh i don't know i think i kind of miss having that ability to sort of look back on some of my thoughts um regarding the scene regarding culture regarding art regarding music and whatnot fashion and sort of see what i was kind of thinking on record just because sometimes i feel like if i didn't talk about it on the podcast it doesn't necessarily exist i'm not exactly sharing all my views on twitter all the time either so a good way to kind of share my opinion and kind of put my hat in the ring and sort of get me to a level that i want to be a certified tastemaker in, in this thing is obviously to get his blog kept it updating and whatnot and obviously see where that goes so these are the things I'm currently doing. Um, the responses has been funny. I've seen some people obviously saying, yeah, go on, do your thing. There's been a few people that have been, you know, mocking me and laughing and stuff, which has been quite hilarious because I feel like when you put up resolutions, it's sort of similar to when if you're a bigger dude and you start saying you want to work out, immediately you start getting people you know getting at you and replying with messages and offering you unsolicited advice in terms of what work how you should do what diet you should be on and it's always nonsense right they never know what they're talking about but there's a lot of people kind of you know acting like they do and i felt like you know this new resolution sort of vibe is similar because for in my head sometimes when i think about it 
it's more fun i feel like personally for me again i'm somebody that's a heavy detractor right i'm really in the flipping dark side field dsp community of detractors i'm on kiwi farms all that stuff i'm looking at that stuff i'm looking at all the wing stuff i'm looking at all the low tier god stuff i'm involved in that stuff. i'm really intrigued by those characters and how they're you know just able to kind of go through life blissfully unaware of why people dislike them and just continually scamming fans and being horrible human beings but still striving and succeeding in some way shape or form which in my opinion in, my striving success barrier is very low right because it, come, it mostly comes from being not able to work a nine to five because i've been doing that most of my life even though i have all these creative endeavors that i would like to do there's never been a period in my life where i haven't had a full-time job i've always had to have one because that was what i relied on in terms of consistent kind of pay to pay rent to pay my lifestyle whatever it may be so when i see these demonstrably horrible people able to strive despite their obvious character defaults and personality defaults and um just whatever they do and they make no real effort to change also which is also something that's fascinating i love that about them dsp wings of redemption low tier god it's not even like they're open to the idea of changing how they navigate through life or how they treat people or how they come across or change the perception of what how they come across they don't care they don't care they're unaware they're blissfully unaware they pretend they're unaware whatever it may be it's just really interesting regardless the reason why i mentioned it is that sorry i feel like it's um far more enjoyable to laugh and point and snicker at those people i said snicker they'll say never one it's far more enjoyable to snicker and laugh at them because they're you know quote-unquote failures like aside from the monetary you know gain and the ability to like not work a nine-to-five and support their family on you know streaming salary or whatever it may be or every other part of their life is a complete failure because everybody looks at them like a joke, right? They kind of get laughed at from all sides of the internet outside their little hardcore group of fans and whales. No one really likes them. And I wouldn't really want to live that sort of life. So they're a legit failure. So it's more funny, I feel like, to laugh at those kind of guys because they're never going to change. So just enjoy the freak show. It's kind of like our weird internet sleuth version of the Kardashians, right? It's our kind of weird reality TV show that we get to watch in real time. But I felt like maybe it's just me. But if somebody is trying to get their life together and they generally on a, you know, a piece of crap, it's not that enjoyable to laugh at what they're trying to do. I wouldn't imagine. Right? I know there are some people online who are quite cringy. I stumbled across this one guy on Twitter the other day who was, you know, crying because he did a 10K, some fat dude who's now skinny, which is always the worst personality trait, right? When a guy is fat and then they lose a bunch of weight and they make losing weight their entire personality. It's just cringe. It's the same thing with a dude that loves pale ales, with the one that talks about flipping motorbikes, guys that love wearing flipping workwear, there's a particular kind of personality or person who kind of adopts those hobbies and lets it form their entire personality. And that comes across on social and it's really cringe. And obviously it's something you see a lot with weight loss, you know, a guy with a skinny body and a fat man's head. It's annoying, but it was still quite heartwarming. So after the initial one to five seconds of you looking at him thinking, oh, well, you're cringe or a loser, you immediately step into, oh, that's still quite good. You went from being this fat, docile, um, bedridden, chair-ridden, um, recluse shutting to now you're doing these 10Ks around your neighborhood. Even if you're walking really fast, there's still a lot for a bigger dude to kind of go out there and put your body through like, all that extraneous uh, cardiovascular work to the point where you're losing weight and you're making healthier lifestyle choices in terms of what you're eating and drinking. Congratulations, bravo to you. Well done. So it's hard to laugh at that person because they're actually trying and they're doing it. But when somebody that's not doing it, it's, doesn't, it's not as fun. So that's why I look at people that are laughing at my list. I'm like, huh, interesting thing to laugh about. I wonder if it's just like a natural you know reaction to stuff like this because generally people don't think you're going to do it which is fine right if you don't think i'm going to do it fair enough but it doesn't necessarily matter if i do all of it or not really in the grand scheme of things because even if i do like two off this list it's still a hell of achievement at the end of the year to look back on aside from everything else i'm going to do in the next 12 months it's still quite a sick achievement but what it does like i said before is that it provides me with like guardrails it kind of gives me a, a minimum recommended list of things I need to do per day. And if I look at that list of stuff, aside from, what am I looking at? Aside from maybe the 50 subs, 50,000 subs on YouTube and they're maintaining a weight of 200 pounds per year, the rest of the activities per day will basically mean I'll have to commit to what? 
maybe four to six hours per day on those things. Maybe a couple of hours of reading a day. Uh, one hour I'll spec out for working out. An hour again for the, you know, for the uh, language learning. And then an hour for the blog post, which are probably going to be sure. Because I'm writing it on my own blog post. I'm not I've been proofreading it to get published in the New York Times. So it's not that much, right? It's four to six hours per day. You're committing to improving parts of your life that you feel like needed to improve, which are going to bring you some level of happiness, satisfaction, fulfillment, blah, blah, blah. Which is obviously stuff that's not quantifiable, but it still will make you feel good. And if anything, going into the new year wouldn't you want to feel better than you did in 2022 i know i would you know you, we can all make a lot of money you know money can be made fair that's cool um you can go on nicer fancier holidays you can buy fancier things but i don't know wouldn't you like just to feel better i had a lot of weird health stuff happen last year you know i had just a lot of mood stuff happen like just just whatever like everyone else has had in the world i'm not special just well, I would like to feel better next year. So if good stuff makes me feel better in some way, shape, or form, it's no harm, no foul play. And like I said, it. I just don't. I don't know. Maybe it's just me, but I, I wouldn't see it as a laughable thing to be as somebody that's trying to make a list. It's like I looked at somebody. Like a recent example would be like Lex Friedman. I checked out Lex Friedman, and he was posting some stuff about books he was reading, and the books he was reading were really, you know, a little bit cringe, a little bit corny. But that's Lex in it. He's a little bit, you know, he's on the autism spectrum. Um, you know, he's that kind of dude. He's a turbo dork, so he's gonna do what he's gonna do. But after the initial one to five seconds of just laughing at him and his list, he's like, oh, that's commendable. You're gonna go reread read all these classical books. So all these classic books. Um, and, you know, you're going to probably gain something out of them for committing to reading them throughout the entire year and sharing your learnings with the internet. But people legitimately were mocking him and laughing at him, but more so just because of the list of what he's reading, not because of what he was trying to achieve in the year, which is definitely something that I didn't really, you know, pan. I didn't really maybe have in mind that people were going to do. But, you know, the internet's got the internet, so it is what it is. But I thought it was an interesting reaction to somebody sharing a New Year's resolution, like, yeah, okay, you're not going to do that. Ah, oh, so okay maybe i won't but you know if i do it's still sick and even if i do it's not like i'm gonna come back and say ha I proved you wrong i did it it's just for myself it's not for anybody else i think everybody's noticed that i think well, anybody knows this to be true when you first start working out i know for me especially being a former fatty when you first start working out especially if you're a lad you do it primarily to try and make yourself more attractive to the opposite sex that's what i did it for i knew for a minute but half of the reason also was because i really wanted to fit in all the fashion clothes that i was into because i couldn't at that time i loved wearing like you know comme des garçons men sorry comme des garçons shirts junior watanabe shirts or comme des garçons shirt shirts you know what i mean junior watanabe stuff i like wearing neighborhood i like wearing double taps i like wearing bait back then supreme and all them things nowadays is different because i've seen the supreme even they have double xl back in the day those no fingers are double xl you have to get an xl you have to kind of like stretch it out with your arms if you're a former fat you know what i'll go on you have to get a t-shirt and that kind of like expand it to make it fit you and whatnot the jackets and stuff sometimes work but the t-shirts are always a bit of a myth so I just did it mostly, you know, again, half to get girls and half to kind of fit into clothes. But then once you start getting into it and it becomes like a lifestyle thing, you realize that it just brings you more satisfaction, especially if you're somebody like myself who kind of has undiagnosed, you know, um, non-specific sort of mental issues going on anyway. Carving out a day in your an hour per day or sometimes two per day where you get to kind of focus on the workout and not think about anything else in your life can do wonders for your mental health and whatnot and again it all becomes self it all becomes more selfish intentions as opposed to you know hey i want to attract people i want to wear cooler clothes to make myself look cooler it just becomes more so again how this makes me feel and whatnot and the things may be tied around it also because sometimes you feel like, you know, you make your best decisions when you're like kind of the workout mode guy because you sleep earlier, you're not up late, you're not drinking all the time, you're not doing lots of DRUGS and all that sort of malarkey. But hey, what can you do? Everyone's got their things. But if you have a list or whatever that you want to share, that what you're going to get up to, let me know in the comments down below. If you're listening to this in the audio version, you know, email me. I'll put the link in of the email down below as well in the description so you can check it out. But I'd love to know what is your New Year's Eve resolutions going forward? Is it a list of things like I mentioned? Is it a theme that you're trying to, you know, carry into the new year? Are you asking yourself broad sweeping questions about yourself and whatnot? Are you trying to make one to two to three to four to five change lifestyle or life change relationship changes in your life going forward? Or are you just doing like probably what most people would do and just kind 
kind of keeping on keeping on and making sure you keep the lights on whatever it is let me know in the comments down below i'd love to hear your thoughts and opinions moving on quickly went to mention this because this is happening in real time it's currently the unfold 2424 that i may be going to in a few hours we never know and it's also the sylvester club night happening in Berghain, happening in xxx club happening in xxx room which i think is the former room for laboratory also happening in how what's happening in Panama bar but it's basically loads of really popping new year's eve or new year's day story celebrations happening at Berghain, happening at fold here in london the Berghain thing is really interesting because from what I can see so far looking at the Berghain live Instagram and if you're a club head like myself and you haven't followed the Berghain live Instagram then make sure you do if you're also a fan of Fold then I recommend you highly to follow an account called Unfold Line Live that is U-N-F-O-L-D-L-I-N-E-L-I-V-E, Unfold Line Live on Instagram. And what they do here, according to the description, is that they do live Unfold queue updates. So Unfold is a in-house club night that they do there at Fold. It's kind of like an extension of a sort of resistance night they do where it's residents. This is more so sort of friends and family than other people that want to play. Maybe famous names they can't put on lineups because they've got non-compete clauses in their contract, whatever it may be. But it's a good chance to kind of rave on a Sunday and it usually starts from like 12 p.m in the afternoon all the way to 12 a.m but i think this one runs from 12 p.m all the way to like 6 or 8 in the morning so it's going to be wild it's going to be amazing regardless it's usually really rams usually really full this is the kind of new day club kids go out and have fun it's pretty decent so think about it if you you know if you think about it like i do and you obsess over this stuff it's quite cool that fold have created have kind of carved out this day and kind of made it a thing because before it wasn't really a thing unless you were going to like forest raves like i was you know a few years ago it wasn't really a thing to rave on a sunday um now they're making that thing so that looks pretty cool but regardless it gets really full it gets really packed and sometimes the queue can be crazy and sometimes it get to a point where it's so full inside you do one in one out so it's quite handy to know what's actually happening and what's going on so there's those two you know those two accounts unfold line live and berghain line live are definitely ones i recommend you check out because they do a good job at kind of you know um highlighting what's going on and kind of making sure people know what the deal is so what i want to point out first of all was a berghain line live instagram account by all accounts from what i can see on the instagram story I'll just quickly scan for it now but the queue is insane for the sylvester club night right which is the new year's day event that's going to go on until i think like I think Monday or Tuesday morning. I'm not too sure. Let me just actually, actually let's let's double check it. Let me take this. Off. Let's double let's double check it and make sure we know here. I think this goes on until if I'm not sure Tuesday morning. Because I went to one in June that was kind of like the unofficial one, but I'm not too sure how long this one goes. So let's just double check. Let's just move this across so I can show you what the deal is. But this is the sylvester club now it's just happening right now look how many people already played jesus christos and of course this is the main okay cool so that's uh, okay so it's gonna go until monday i think i'm kind of hyping it up a little bit too much it's not gonna go to tuesday so it's gonna go until like the early hours of monday Steffi's playing the last set of burger and main floor that's pretty awesome that they've got um you know four no five no six seven shit it's all residents from 4 a.m all the way until 4 4 a.m last night to 4 a.m tomorrow or 4 a.m sorry sunday to 4 a.m monday is all people associated resident djs or people tied the bunch of beauty burger and playing you got Fadi Mohem, you got Key Clef, you got Barker, Jacko Jacko, Adil, Virginia, Ben Clock, Tasha, Steffi. Pretty sick. Um, and this is obviously the list of people playing again in the other rooms also, so it's nice, whatever it may be. But looking at the queue, man, is insane. I don't know why people went there went there late, sorry. I've done this beforehand where I've gone to these sort of things. And for me personally, unless you're going like really early in the late late at night when no one's there there's no real point to queuing up that late i don't think so because people i've read are waiting legitimately like four hours plus sometimes six from what i can see so far i saw a picture of the guest list queue which is usually the queue that's on like the side of the Berghain, you know entrance as you come out it's on the left hand side that's usually the queue the, the guest list and re-entry queue as you can see here from this picture right there that's the that's basically the guest list queue heading into the park as if i'm not familiar if i'm not crazy Am I crazy or am I not crazy? 
or am I getting yeah that is the, I'm pretty sure that is that is the because I think Bergen is this way so I'm pretty sure this is the guest list queue that's going all the way back through the park and most of you will know if you've come that direction there's a little park on the way no around the corner from the Sunflower Hostel also which I've stayed at once before it's a nice little cool let me take back call cool. it's a nice cheap hostel to stay at around the corner from Bergheim which is usually anywhere between like 30 euros to 60 euros for like four nights so it's quite handy to do so but this is the queue all the way back into that park so you can imagine how many people deep it is and these are all people who have either got guest lists with people who play there family friends and family or people that have got a re-entry so they got they're gonna get their ticket stamped to get charged five euros or whatnot to get back in again Personally, I don't understand that. If you go to a flipping New Year's Day event in Bergheim, especially considering how long the queues are, why would you leave? It doesn't make any sense. Like, you have to go there prepared. You have to take all your stuff with you, you know, all your goodies, all your sandwiches, all your little treats, whatever it may be. Drink what you need to drink in a queue. Go in and have a good time. Um, you shouldn't be thinking about heading out. Oh, I forgot my bag. Oh, I forgot my baggy. Oh, I forgot my jacket. It's like, leave that stuff behind and just try and figure it out when you get in there. Leaving is just insane. Well, but also staying in there for 36 hours plus is crazy. I think the most I've stayed in there on, you know, consecutively, maybe 16 hours or so. But yeah, face is a bit nuts. So people are posting. The line is moving slow. As you can see, there are loads of crazy pictures and stuff. But yeah, look how long that guest list queue is. That's like 10 people already posting these sort of things. And the main line is just silly. And the queue cutting is just, oof, must be another level. When I went there in June, it was already bad for that makeup cup Sylvester. And people are already saying in parts of, you know, I've seen on Reddit and other places, people are complaining about it. But god bless you if you're out there and you're letting people queue jump i couldn't do it man you're a much better person than me there's something about people that cut in the line that just kind of you know makes me rage makes me kind of turn complete red hot mate i can't handle it i have to say something which is obviously not best idea because you know who wants to be having a you know a shouting match with some stranger in the queue heading into a club that's notoriously known for vibe checking you whilst you're standing in the line that's what you happened before i'm not sure it happens anymore but back in the day the bouncers would be looking at the queue and checking out people and seeing anyone's acting sketchy, acting too loud, being too, you know, having too much fun. <laughs> and then usually already kind of, you know, cross you off the list and say, yeah, you're definitely not getting it. So by the time you get to the front, you have no idea, but you're already denied because you decided to, you know, drink a flipping Bex in the queue too quickly. <laughs> Whatever it might be. I don't think they bother now because it's just so busy. You just wait until you get to the door. But I can't imagine having an argument with a queue jumper is going to really endear you to some of these bouncers there who, you know, go out of their way to make sure that you're abiding by the rules and whatnot. But I can't do it. I can't deal with it. I'd rather do that than try and be a narc and complain to the bouncer. Like, excuse me, excuse me. He or she, he, she or they flipping cut into the queue. I'm not having that. I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to tap you on the shoulder aggressively, do that like aggressive, that kind of, you know, adult sort of like primary school tap on your shoulder. Um, which is obviously really rude because I'm invading your personal space. I'm touching you without permission, all that good stuff. But you're also cutting in front of me in the queue. So I feel like we're both pieces of shit in this moment. So let's just get in the mud. So as soon as I do that, I get into a shouting match, tell you to go behind, or I just silently just go in front of you and just keep it moving. But the whole queue jumping thing's not happening. Not on my watch. Never, no way, no doubt. But again, am I going to wait six hours in the queue to go to a club? I've seen pictures and videos of people standing in the club as the clock was, you know, as it was kind of the countdown to New Year's Day was happening. Because usually I think if you're going out on New Year's Day, you usually care about the whole like 10, 9, 8, 2, 1 nonsense, right? And you want to be like, every new year and hug people and shit. I think you do. I think you do. Personally, I think you do. So if you do care about that stuff, why are you in the queue? <laughs> why would you go so late? You know what I mean, like, I'd be, I, I would have been there at like 9 p.m., 10 p.m. queuing already just to guarantee I get in because I don't want any hassle or whatnot. That's what I would have done. But, you know, again, that's just me. People are different. Hopefully people get in. And the good thing is that you've got plenty of time. You've got, you know, the rest of the morning, the rest of, yeah, the rest of tonight, the rest of the morning to still get in. So hopefully that works out for most people. But I've been hearing it's one in, one out. So God bless everybody that's there. It's going to be an absolute mad situation. I just want to see some of the live pictures there actually let me see it go on the location it doesn't actually work on your but on the instagram you can actually tag the geo tag location and look for people's stories and see what the vibe is saying it's a good way to kind of you know get a bit of a vibe check instead of asking endless questions everywhere you can just see it with your own eyes so let's see what pops up here as i kind of click on the recents we've got some pictures of people that have played there as you can see oh this is all funny did you guys see this this is quite hilarious 
So a while back, this was shared. I went viral. I think maybe a few month, few weeks ago. Yeah, that's we go November. Right? Maybe uh, maybe it was later than that. I don't know. Who cares? But this young lady decided to get a tattoo on her left arm, upper left arm. That basically reads. It basically is kind of a a, a set list, a lineup list. Sorry, of people that played at a night that she went. And I guess this might have been a night that she really fell in love with the club, or maybe it was the first time she went there. Whatever special connection. You know, we've all got those nights. I've got mine, which was when DJ Harvey played about kind of few years back. It might have been twenty eighteen, might be twenty seventeen might be 2019, I'm not really sure exactly the year, but around then, things are a bit fuzzy, you know, copious or copious amounts of flipping cat were taken around that time, but still, I remember that, we've all got those lineups that we like, and some of us, you know, regular, regular people who aren't as edgy as this girl, we just get a flipping, what do you call it, um, a flyer or something, right? They, they usually have them that you can take some old ones also with the artwork and whatnot, and you can, people collect them and whatnot, and those are quite handy to have or you just keep the wristband that you had whatever or you take a picture or you frame the picture of you wearing the wristband if you lose it whatever but i don't think many of us ever sat down and thought you know what i'm gonna get the flipping uh lineup tattooed on my arm with the times as well that people played um and who she got here she's got etap kyle she's even got the little um what you call it, um, what they represent, record label or whatnot on the edge, that's what happens on the lineup, right, they have the little representation thing here on the side, she even got that, she went fully in, so she got Etap Kyle, Natty Serres, Power Midnight Shift, Cashew, SPF DJ, LSD XOXO, and Fiak playing there, those are all the people that she was big fans of, and I remember seeing this thinking, this is legitimately the height of corniness, but then immediately after the five seconds, I think it was corny, I was like, you know what, this is also pretty cool, because we all have these moments that we kind of remember in our kind of, you know, dance floor, or club night, or club, or nightlife kind of life, you know, that we had, um, or maybe that we're still in at the moment, that we sort of look back fondly on, and also I think like, I'd much rather have like a million of these types of people in the club, personality types, than people who are just there to sort of record DJ sets through their phone and watch the performances through their phone. Because clearly you give a crap about the music, you give a crap about the people playing, you give a crap about the bookings, you give a crap about the labels, about the releases, about the DJing styles, personal, whatever. You give a crap about it, like for real, for real to the point where you're going and inking some a line up on your flipping arm which is crazy but also pretty endearing um and it shows that your the club is definitely doing you know the correct thing because you're attracting people like this to your space who really do give a shit but you know for the regular regular person out there it can look a bit like a loser thing but i liked it i'm not going to lie i did like it looking back at it would i do it myself of course not of course bloody not but let's see some of the recent posts people have been uploading um, as you can see there from this person's picture actually she's got a really cool um, is that the blood sugar bag I think it is a good New York boots and blood sugar bag um, 13 hours of fear and loathing well she went for 13 hours that's crazy but yeah you can already see the long queue here in the back which is going crazy the brick uh, these guys pictures earlier in the day the queue looks a bit nuts I don't know man I just couldn't have done it is that um, what's his name yeah uh, what's his name Norman Nodge right yeah standing looking stoic outside you know, covered or in the background full of beers and this monolith building in the background. But yeah, I could have done it. I think if I would have went there and it was that late and, you know, and the queue was that long, I just would have kind of chalked it up as an L and kind of went home. But the fact that people are still standing there having a good time, then fair play to people. But personally, I couldn't have done it. But big up everybody that was there and was doing the damn thing, waiting to get in and whatnot. I do like that from what I've heard of it, I'm prioritizing people in the paid list. I know it's a bit of a shitty thing to say because I think if you're a guest list, you know, you should be able to get in also. But I feel like if the guest list is as long as it is, what we've seen in the flipping video I showed you, where it's going into the park, you should be prioritizing people that are actually paying to get in. Um, I know some of the re-entry people are going to be happy because they're obviously paid to get in also. But hey, you the risk you take trying to go back outside again. But yeah, um, happy to see it, happy to see it. And of course, Unfold is also looking really nice and busy and chock -a block also, judging by the stories that Flipping Unfold put out here. Um, the queue is around the corner. Oh my God. <laughs> Jesus Christ. At 11 p.m. Look at the queue already. I think I might have to stay home, mate. Look at the queue at 11.26. It's around the corner. And I've never ever stayed, I don't think, around the... I've never been... I don't think... Oh, sorry, let me put the screen. Sorry. I've never been... Um, 
at fold where it's longer than this. I think the longest I've been is where maybe the door, it's maybe the end of where the doors of the studios are kind of. If you've, if you've been there, you know what I mean. But I've never had to queue that long, but the queue looks crazy. And that's easily like 50 to 100 people in that queue. And the building is open. They've opened all the rooms that they have available and it's already chock a block. So you can imagine. And it's obviously the perfect place to be also for a New Year's Day. Think about it, right? It's so local. You know what you're going to get in terms of the club. Like everyone there's going to be cool and chill. Um, it's going to be a great vibe. They've decided to enforce some door selection at the door also, which is a big thing. And they're going to turn away people who they don't think match the vibe and whatnot, which doesn't really happen in the UK. It's not really a thing. It's mostly something that we try and cap from Berlin, but it doesn't necessarily work. People just, you know, feel pretty entitled to coming in if they have money. So if you tell them they can't get in based on their vibe, they just don't respond to it too well. So, you know, the fact that they're doing that and there's still this level of a queue tells you that it's a busy, busy day out there. But yeah, it's ram. Look at that. God almighty. Absolutely crazy amount of people outside. 20 minutes ago. Four, 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 four. Look at that. Everyone everywhere hanging outside oh my god it goes way to the back <gasps> okay cool so yeah <laughs> i think that whole adventure is probably over i'm probably gonna stay in and edit the pod and do some other bits and bobs so, yeah big up everybody out on new year's day i wonder if for you guys did you go out on new year's eve do you care about new year's day is there something that kind of interests you in any way shape or form um i think the last time i actually did a thing thing was many many years ago and that was really good actually that was a friend put on a little party somewhere near london bridge or something where it was sort of like bring your own booze it was in a cool little venue they had friends and friends friends of friends djing they set up a really cool installation with lights and balloons and whatnot it was a pretty decent vibe but that was the last time i went out that way for the most part most of my kind of new year's eve and new year's day celebrations have centered around going to go and get something to eat some nice cocktails watch the flipping fireworks and just go home it's not really been anything outside of that and before that most of my time of new year's eve new year's day was spent in church and that also wasn't that bad it was quite chill you know most of my people that i went there to church with were quite good friends and people you considered your brothers and sisters you would chill there you would eat you celebrate new year's eve you might get a cheeky little snog here and there from some crush you had in church. And then, you know, you hang out with the boys, have some drinks, eat some food and go home. It's pretty cool, pretty fun. Um, but I never really tried to kind of get in the muck and try to fight for the flipping club spots and whatnot. Number one, the prices are always crazy, right? At the moment, I think Bergheim is like 55 euros. I think it's usually 30 or something. So that's already a big bump you have to take. Apart from the bumps you're taking indoors, way and then of course um stuff like unfold you know decent that's a good little thing that's happened but for the most part the raves and stuff are i think grossly um of the, the you know they're over overrated and overcharged and usually they're big let down those big events i know from being a promoter big events don't work well like you think halloween and stuff's gonna work well for you new year's Eve's gonna work well for you bank holidays and all that stuff and if anything the reason why is usually because of the competition and also the fact that they're very unpredictable to sort of gauge what's actually going on what you should be doing if you want to put those events on is trying to create a vibe an atmosphere a little community with your events year round so that when those events come around there's another event in a the year. They're not like, oh, we're celebrating Halloween, come to this crazy Halloween party because everywhere, every place in the world, doesn't matter if you're the third world, second world, first world, everyone's got a crazy Halloween party happening. They're, they're, you know, they're two a penny, mate. They're everywhere. So same people just on the fact that it's a crazy Halloween party and, you know, um, fancy dresses a flipping mandatory that's not really going to get people out you have to kind of have a vibe already going for what you do and then people also think hey you know i'm going to hang out like i hire with folder burger it's less so about the lineups i'm also about the vibe of the place and the good people that go in it that's what makes me comfy and happy to go there year in year out regardless of lineups because i know nine or eight times eight to nine times out of ten i'm gonna have a good time regardless if i know who's playing so that happens so yeah i would like to know for you guys what do you do in new year's eve new year's day did you go out did you stay in do you care about it do you not let me know in the comments down below moving on so we have this update regarding theophilus london that's concerning but also helpful because it helps clear some stuff up and you know it's not a rumor that i was kind of reporting on beforehand which was kind of coming from some you know second and third sources or friends online but according to the los angeles times he has officially been registered as missing and he was last seen on skid row 
and most of you know what Skid Row is. It's an it's an area or street on LA, mostly a street where essentially all the homeless, um, the drug addled, mental health addled, and just people who have basically, you know, just lost everything in life and kind of are looking for some sort of direction or comfort within a little community. They kind of hang out in this really sketchy looking part of LA called Skid Row, which I've been to a couple of times. I went to LA, and it's a bit of a it's a bit of a mind f. I, I have to I have to tell you that you think you've seen Skid Row by looking at videos and pictures online. When you go there in real life and see these people, you know, human beings just like you and I, clearly looking like they've, you know, maybe given up. They're just in another planet mentally. Um, psyche is all disheveled and broken. Obviously, they look and smell like absolute putrid. Like the the putrid smell of Skid Row is something that also doesn't leave you. It really does bum you out. Not gonna lie, especially being in LA, the home of the entertainment um, industry, the home of Hollywood. There's you know millionaires and billionaires living all over the place. You know Hollywood Hills behind gated communities, and there's this level of poverty. It's just like wow, man. Life truly isn't fair. Like, truly isn't fair. And from what I've seen so far, what I read online, no one's really doing anything to really address or to fix that issue. It could be mostly a political thing. Maybe the Democrats are kind of resistant to kind of, you know, changing anything to do with Skid Row because maybe they think it's inhumane to take people who are homeless off of the streets and put them in the homes and try and get them rehabilitated and off drugs and blah, blah, blah. Who knows what it's the deal is, but from what I remember going there, it was something that legitimately was a vibe killer to the point where I didn't want to do anything the rest of the day. It just doesn't leave you in that respect. You kind of just be like, rah, Ted, man. And for the most part, what you hear a lot when you go there, especially if you go with somebody that's from the area, a lot of the people that I've heard that are end up in Skid Row are people who initially moved to LA with a dream. They moved to LA with a couple of dollars in their pocket, a suitcase full of dreams, and they went out there to try and make it happen. It didn't happen, and they suddenly wake up and you're in Skid Row. And it happens very quickly from what I've been listening to and watching clips of people who are homeless and describing their prior lives. Some of them may be like Uber drivers that always have flipping amazing businesses outside of Uber. Some of them may be lying, but I think for the most part, there are a lot of people on there outside of the people who are so clearly suffering from mental health issues who could or maybe or addiction and whatnot, who are clearly great people who just ended up in, you know, had a shitty, you know, roll of the dice, got dealt with a shitty deck of cards and just, you know, one mistake after a mistake, one mistake after one and the other, and then suddenly you end up homeless and you're gone. So I'm hoping these reports aren't true. I really am hoping they aren't true because if someone like Free Office London, who I thought at the one point was at the apex, the Mount Kilimanjaro of flipping clout and influence, you know, he was surrounded by... The thing about Free Office London, you have to also remember, he was maybe one of the first, maybe outside of Rocky, who kind of had that mainstream, not mainstream, I say mainstream, but he had that kind of snotty elitist fashion cosign whilst also having a cosign of the quote-unquote streetwear sneakerheads, whilst also having a cosign of the hip-hop type people. You don't really have that many people who can kind of traverse that again, apart from the Rocky. Even Rocky still, I don't feel like he's all the way accepted within the fashion with a capital F. Maybe because he doesn't like to hang around with people too much. I only see him do himself with Luebe. He doesn't really, you know, uh, frolic around the fashion weeks as much as maybe other people did. But maybe, or maybe outside of someone like a Virgil, who maybe on the design front, RIP. But Fiofa Thunder was one of the first people that I saw really smashing it on that way. And also somebody that I felt like went out of their way to represent New York, but also wasn't afraid of branching out and doing bigger and better things abroad in LA and international, right? He just was all that kind of rolled into one. And there was a time, you know, pictures of, you know, activations and, you know, uh, after hours and parties, and whatnot, he'd always be in there somewhere in the background with his big hat on or some level of a hat on, right? I still remember that lovers snapback from back in the day that 40 ounce van did. I think if you know, you know, and whatnot. So still a legend in that respect. Even to a point where some really corny, you know, loser type guys in London, some guys that I know, actually, I think I saw one of them at Berghain once who kind of copied, I think some of you may know this. I think if you live in a metropolitan city and if your first London was popping when you were maybe, let's say, I don't know, between the ages of like 18 to 25 
and you would have known that he was really popping and doing his thing, especially when you've considered the whole like skinny jeans, Jordans, leather jackets, snapbacks, starter caps, and those big brimmed hats, whatever he was wearing back then. You would have known that there was many other black skinny dudes, tall black skinny dudes back in the day, who were basically cosplaying as your first London. And I guess if you are from a small city, a small town, and maybe you're not really that plugged in or you're just getting in the scene, you may think they're actually setting the trends and then really you get in the scene and you realise, oh no, they're just copying this guy. And there's this one guy we had in London. Um, I don't even know his fucking name. It just looks like a prick. But no, I don't really like his vibe. <laughs> but regardless, I remember he always used to have it. I remember just looking at him in my head like, you had an absolute wild. Imagine, imagine a cop to somebody's complete style and personality and making it yours. And also walking around like you're doing something with those big hats and vests and what the way and skinny jeans and I think he just didn't wear the Jordans. I think he just wore like cowboy boots or something, right? Like Saint Laurent boots or some copy of them, right? Or whatnot. But the guy did a lot for the scene. Honestly, Fear of Lost did a lot for the scene. So it is pretty sad to see the lack of people, big name people in the industry not really posting it. And not really making a fuss about the fact that he's been missing for so long since what this I think July or June or whatnot. I've reported before, and obviously the only kind of logical conclusion would be that he must have burned so many bridges during his time on his downward, maybe somewhat spiral, or maybe from the fact that he wasn't that relevant, or maybe in a you know current public conversation that to the point where people aren't really concerned for his health and safety, which is wild because. <sighs> Maybe it's a while, because if you think about it, if you're on a scene, no one really cares about you as a person. They care about what you can do for them. They're not really trying to pretend like they're your friends. They're not really trying to pretend that they care about your mental, physical well-being. They just care about you because you work in this cool store. You know somebody that works at this cool agency. Um, you're pally pally with people that work at this brand. You get free stuff from there. You get free entry here. That's what they care about for the most part. They don't really care about you. So maybe it's not that surprising. But I still think if you're somebody that are pretending to be his friend, there's still some clout to be had, I would imagine. This is really dark. There's still some clout to be had in the fact that he's missing and you're posting about him. Because you can post text messages, you can post pictures of yourself together. Like people are doing all that with Virgil, right? RIP. When he passed away, people were flipping, screenshotting their text messages, posting pictures of them together to prove that they actually knew him. All this sort of like corny, cringy, horrible, you know, clout chasey, um, making it all about myself shit that everybody hates. We all know that. We know how horrible it is. And people are doing it on the regular. So I'm surprised those very same people aren't doing the same thing with someone like the office London to been missing for so long when you can really use that kind of information to maybe help to people to kind of spec together or fret, put an idea in their heads of what the guy was like or maybe also just kind of you know put yourself in a conversation and make yourself front and center of it be like hey i knew this guy i text him about this i text him about that i've seen a couple of screenshots like that dms but these come from i think like people who generally have a concern for him but everybody else who was trying to you know uh, vampire sucky's clout has essentially wiped their hands of him completely because they're not posting anything about him so he must have done again I'm just speculating here I don't know nothing about it I just know him as a fan looking from the outside in I may have met him briefly from afar once or twice that's it really and again can't really say he's a friend or someone that I know that deeply in any way shape or form but I'm just surprised they haven't made much of a fuss about it and again it maybe just illustrates that he must have done some really heinous things behind the scene I've read some stuff about him and issues with DRUGS, which again, none of my business and don't really think that's a big deal. Cause I think a lot of people are struggling with those sort of things in the scene. They just don't talk about it or they keep it on the wraps. And just because he can't, you know, maybe keep it on the wraps as affected his life doesn't mean he's a bad person. But I'm sure there's other things that have gone on that we don't know about that maybe have affected people's idea of him and maybe what don't want to speak about it anymore, which is again really upsetting. Could you imagine if he did do some messed up stuff, the fact that he's in this has happened and he's been missing since June and July. You'd think people want to put that to one side isn't it? and be like, you know what? Let's, let's, you know, let bygones be bygones. This dude has been missing for a whole six months. It's going to go into seven and let's just kind of get him found whatnot. But people aren't doing that. So clearly it's in a dark, dark place. But anyway, let's read the report. It says a missing person's report taken on Tuesday indicated that Fiofus London 35 was last in contact with somebody via text message on October 15th. 
uh, the rapper left his home at the one whatever that thing in Ventura Boulevard that day and was last seen on Skid Row. So he could have been at Skid Row living there and doing his thing, or it could have been you go to Skid Row to go and cop because I know a lot of people don't like to cop the conventional way that most people do, Telegram, Darknet and whatnot. Some people like to go do it in person. And we don't really have those things in the UK. We don't really have areas. You know, in London, really, we don't really have it. There may be some blocks that exist, I know, but I can't think of many areas in my area where you can go and cop. You usually have to call somebody and they have to come to you. But obviously, Skid Row, you know, home of all the J U N K I S S, um, it makes sense. A description of the clothing London was wearing last day has hasn't was seen wasn't sorry he was seen in hasn't. Oh, let me go back again. A description of clothing London was wearing the last day he was seen wasn't immediately available. The record label secretly issued a statement when on behalf of the London's family it said, "Theo, your dad loves you, son." We miss you and all your friends and relatives are searching for you. Wherever you are, send us some signal. No matter what, we'll come and get you, son. London is six feet two inches tall, weighs 175 pounds, has dark brown eyes. Any more information, caught that there. Born in Trinidad, raised in Brooklyn. That means David. But yeah, crazy. Isn't it? So there's official missing persons um, report out there for him. Everyone on the scene doesn't seem to give a crap. Uh, maybe because they don't like him as a person, maybe because they've extracted all the clout that they can out of him. But what it does go to prove is that these people in the scene have no souls. Because if it was me, unless he did something to me physically, like unless he did something to harm my family and friends, there's nothing that I can't forgive to, you know, aid in the search of somebody. Especially on the internet. Because again, some people could say, oh yeah, they may, they may be doing it offline, they're not doing it on the internet, but these people only exist on social media. If they're not doing stuff on social media, it doesn't exist. So, if they're not clout chasing off of it. So the fact that they're not trying to clout chase off of it shows that they just generally don't give a crap and that means that they have no souls, which is really scary. But I think if it was me, I could let bygones be bygones and say, you know what, you scum me over, you did this, you did that. And again, unless it's something that they did physically to harm my close family or friends, everything can be forgiven to a point where I'm going to help look for you or put the bat signal out to my 100,000 followers out there on my verified account that, you know, it should be on their mind to be keeping an eye out for a six foot two black guy I used to hang out with back in the day during Kanye West listening sessions, right? I'd want to put that bat signal out there because you must have shared some good times back in the day, but the fact that these guys don't want to do it speaks a lot for how um, dark the scene can be which is really sad, but you know, it kind of is what it is, you know, in that respect, but hopefully it does get found very soon. Hopefully it's nothing gruesome, nothing sad. That's what we can hope really in this regard. We can't really hope for anything more than that. So we just have to kind of let this lie and let it kind of develop and see what happens. But so far, no kind of updates. I've been checking Twitter and stuff for updates of people posting maybe locations or whereabouts or sightings. I've seen absolutely nothing. It's been radio silence for a while. So it doesn't look good. I'm not going to lie. If you're somebody that's kind of been a fan of true crime and whatnot, you'd know that someone going missing for this long doesn't bode well. But we can only hope and pray that, you know, a miracle can happen and you can kind of pop out and say, hey, guys, I've been at this silent retreat this whole time. I've been getting on my shit. I've been kind of looking at new inspiration, listening to new music. I've been tapping in with this person, whatever. You hope that's the case. You really do hope that's the case because, you know, anything less than that, considering the magnitude and the, the role he played in culture and stuff would be pretty sad, especially it kind of ending in this sort of way. So I hope that's not the case. So, you know, wherever he is, hopefully he gets found very soon and we have some good news to report on that side going forward. So, big up. Oh, yeah, that's what I was thinking about. I was going to say. So I was watching um, a recent episode of End of Sentence, aka 1090 Jake, where he basically goes on a bit of an expose exposing the one and only Boston Richie, somebody I've only been familiar with the last few months, I think, or so, mostly because of his really, really good feature record that he has with um sort of the record that he has featuring future that's been, you know, on my playlist for a while now. I forgot the name of it. Now it escapes me. But most of you would know what I'm talking about if you've kind of seen it. But there's this really great track that he's got in it that's kind of blown him up and took him to astronomical levels of success in a very short space of time. Well anyway, I guess off the back of that um, one of Kodak Black's artists decided to get in a bit of a spat with him online to the point where he revealed some details about him allegedly snitching on a few cases and whatnot and essentially kind of, you know, calling into question whatever image that he had of being a furrow dude and being a gangster and whatnot going forward. And 
end of sentence 1090 jake i do recommend checking out his youtube channel he's got a video on it at the moment um i've got it here on the screen it is titled the story of boston richie witnessing free um murder cases and it's available on his channel called end of sentence definitely go check it out and one of the interesting things about it that got me thinking it was kind of like on the same sort of tip of what's been happening with flipping young Fug and his case and all these people involved in YSL, you know, co-founders, hit men, foot soldiers, essentially turning on him and making it impossible, impossible to see any other outcome apart from getting football numbers in terms of jail term or life or something crazy like that. I can see that happening. I can't see any scenario where that guy walks out of prison, which is really, really sad to see or walks out of jail. It's really, really sad. But it also just got me thinking about how horrible it must be to be a gangster in this modern age that we live in. Because for some reason, I know snitch has been happening for a long time, but obviously it was way more of a taboo back in the day because most of those guys, you know, abided by a code and lived by a lived by lived by a certain street code, abided by, you know, some sort of lifestyle, whatever it may be. But essentially, the idea behind it was that you never spoke to police in any way, shape, or form, and there was always this acceptance that this life of crime that you were engaged in, although the successes can be immediate, the money can be extravagant and crazy. Right? Who wouldn't want to be making? 10 million per day you know like flipping pablo escobar his height and whatnot and all those dudes you watch those documentaries and those tv series narcos and whatnot netflix and especially if you're somebody that may have done drugs in the past or maybe it's somebody that's obsessed with clipping um organized crime the same people are obsessed with other sorts of like true crime stuff like serial killers and whatnot it's co it's kind of like makes sense in your head to sort of like fantasize about a world or a scenario where you would have maybe been the kingpin or the capo of a particular sort of organized crime syndicate and what you would have done in whatever case it may be right you can always have that especially if you're somebody that maybe has sold the, the cut the odd couple of pill the odd couple of gram here on there it can be natural to kind of have this idea that somehow now you are also Pablo Escobar and now you are going to be moving weight and flipping work but quickly, if you're somebody that's sensible, you start to, you know, go through all the cons quickly after the pros and you start to realize that just the ability to, for law enforcement to take away your freedom is already enough of a deterrent for you not to kind of go down that path for the most part. That's mostly most of the reason why maybe I didn't maybe um, succumb to the streets as some of my friends have done. You know, some of them have kind of been in prison for many, many years. Some of them victims of stuff. Some of them are the perpetrators of things. And it's kind of sad to see, but for the most part, I feel like you would be safe to assume that if you do decide to commit your life to a life of crime, you should go through the gamut of pros and cons and accept that a part of the consequences of leading that sort of life is that you may be arrested, you may be killed, or you may be imprisoned. And part of being arrested and imprisoned is that you may spend a considerable amount of your years on this planet living in a confined space. It's just what it is if you commit to that sort of lifestyle. But for whatever reason, this newer generation of people, of kids or gang members in general, they don't seem to be willing to accept that side of the lifestyle that they willingly chose for themselves. Some of them, they didn't willingly choose it because if you're born in a you know, poverty-stricken neighborhood, sometimes gangs aren't as serious as people make them out to be. They're just a means for local kids to sort of band around and kind of make each other feel better, you know, kind of to sort of, you know, contrast from the dire circumstances they're kind of living in or to you know, afford them some level of um protection on the streets especially to living again in a place that's maybe torn between two different neighborhoods it can just be something simple as that so maybe it's something that you don't willingly go into it's something kind of based on where you're kind of born into and you didn't pick your parents you didn't pick where you live in the beginning and you kind of have to kind of suck it up but I feel like if you decide to take the next step and start to do work you have to decide you have to accept I would imagine part of the consequences is that you might get arrested you may end up doing a long time in prison and you also have to accept that part of the lifestyle of gangsters gangster is that you don't ever talk to law enforcement it's always no comment it's always i need my lawyer and that's it there are no you know sharing of information there's no providing information that kind of goes towards contributing to somebody's arrest and them kind of you know being without their family and whatnot, that's not how you do it but and for me even i even knew again not being a gang or anything i even knew it goes to a point of like even if you were beefing with somebody in a rival gang and you knew information about them that could get them nicked and put in prison, 
you wouldn't do that you'd still get them back on the streets you wouldn't try and get them back through using the law enforcement as a proxy you just wait for them to get back on road if they wronged you for instance you wouldn't think just them going to prison was enough you'd let them come out and then when they come out you'd get them like you know Al Paul Martinez is a good example um he you know murdered a bunch of guys when he was out he came out he tried to flaunt and flex and act like he didn't care and sooner rather than later he's you know he ended up getting murked himself in his own car clearly that was I would imagine somebody you know, a victim or a family member tied to people that he may have killed in the past who said this can never lie until his body drops also. So it's kind of what you have to accept. But for some reason, again, like I said, these new generation of kids don't seem to be willing to accept the prison part of it. You look at the whole, you know, slug slime light thing going on at the moment, everyone's taking plea deals. Everyone is essentially is um contributing to young folk going to prison for a very, very long time. They all willingly, you know, got initiated into this gang they initially they were willingly went into it wanting to be a gang member and saying slat and slime life and doing the whole sniffing thing right they all wanted to be a part of that when it was cool and obviously going to ride outs and whatnot and in a moment it becomes an issue where your freedom is at stake they suddenly all want to become sensible and make the smart choice or make the uh, grown-up decision to kind of denounce a life of crime suddenly in that moment and go back to being a regular civilian which is really you know um doesn't necessarily not something that i believe which is which is kind of goes back to maybe a lot of people what they're saying now as a reaction around some of the um, some of the releases on plea deals i think a lot of them have i forgot what the word is called um a lot of them a lot have, have a lot of conditions around their release in terms of being on curfew, not doing drugs and stuff, that's really not going to help them in any kind of way or shape or form. But anyway, regardless, go back to the Boston Richie case. Boston Richie case, sorry. Um, he's obviously been um, highlighted out here. Tony Jake has done a really good video and pointing out some of the things that he may or may not have done in terms of contributing to people's murders and whatnot. I'm going to play a clip, small clip of it and then I'm going to round it off as we continue. But this is a good documentary. I recommend check out all oh, clip, video clips that he does. I recommend check it out. The affidavit clearly states Boston Richie told police he told his co-defendants the car was stolen a total of three times. Because of this, all three teens were arrested and charged with GTA because they knowingly got into a stolen vehicle. Now Boston Richie's team would say he was only 16 at the time and the charges got dropped for the other two teens. But in my opinion, it doesn't matter. The two other teens refused to make statements to police while Boston Richie agreed to make a statement and his statement got them arrested. So in total, Boston Richie has conducted two separate interviews with police, got his own cousin and another teen arrested and gave a sworn statement in a murder case where the alleged shooter was sentenced to prison. And <laughs> I don't know, man. I just, we, I think we just live in a real pick and choose era maybe it's not a generation thing maybe it's just an era i think of the nippo baby discourse there's a lack of acknowledgement on the nippo baby side that just because you've been born into this successful family that's afforded you opportunities to get into the industry uh, you know that maybe regular people don't have or maybe access to certain people even if even if you are really talented there are some people that are always going to question or call into question your um your standing your work they're not going to rate you as a person they're just going to be people that aren't really going to take too well to you being in that space in any way shape or form it just is what it is it's unfortunate but it just is what it is but for whatever reason the nipper baby discourse they don't seem to accept that reality that that is just part of the sort of burden of being born with a name like you know pitt as being your last name or joe lee so Angela, jo yeah whatever it may be right they don't they don't really want to accept that they just want to pick and choose like i want to be my own person but i also want to have the access to this network of people that i wouldn't have had if my dad wasn't a successful director movie star or whatever but i also don't want you to judge me based on the access that i have it's like no like this is just all that comes with it. Same that goes with gang life. If you want to live this fast life, fast money lifestyle, you have to ex accept that there is a level of risk at the end of it that could contribute to you spending a considerable amount of time in prison. And part of the fast life, fast money lifestyle is that when you do get questioned by the police, they just never speak. You just kind of, you know, keep it stum, and they don't. And they suddenly then decide to be 
regular civilians and then decide you know they spend a lot of time talking about how lame and dorky it is to be a regular civilian and how they're so much cooler and i think many people like myself regular civilians we look at them and think yeah they're way cooler and way harder than we are but really are they because it's easy i think to hit an enemy because you've made them out to be an enemy you turn them into a bit of a boogeyman a bogeyman so a boogeyman what have how you pronounce that word how oh, can i say i said it three times three different ways or you just continue it's i think not that easy to get vengeful or get angry to the point where you're going to do a ride out it might be scary and hard to do the do it the first time but i think after you've done it a few times it probably shouldn't be that much it shouldn't probably be that much work or be that hard but the real hard part of it is being solid being loyal not you know betraying your flipping fellow gang members and whatnot and really abiding by that code that that code of silence so that's what is the real hard part of it because who really wants to be in prison for any amount of time even if it's two weeks do you remember the height of covid was it covid when was it maybe it was covid or pandemic times and people were going around looting and whatnot in the uk for some reason i guess to deter people from going out and looting again the police were throwing out some really harsh sentences out when people would loot and i think the famous story was like you know some people went out there and tried to steal flipping bottles of water from shops and got hit with like two week prison sentences right and in the uk we don't have jails like you have in the united states and um, we have prison so if you commit a crime we have to spend some time in you know confinement or whatever it may be you have to go to prison there is no jail so that's obviously horrible so if you do a parking ticket i'm pretty sure that's how it works again i've never been in prison but i'm pretty sure that's how it works there's no, there's no jail here in the uk so imagine robbing a store and getting convicted for shoplifting and then you get flipping thrown in prison with legit murderers with legit diddlers with legit essayers and r words and stuff it's mad isn't it but i remember that happening and that being a big thing and you know it's one thing for some regular civilian who's just you know decided on a whim to go and join in a bit of flipping social unrest and try and fight the flipping bureaucracy red tape and government restrictions by stealing a kinder boy on a bottle of water that's one thing and then decided to snitch because you're facing six months in prison for it but if you're a legit gang member and you decided to do ride outs and you decided to commit to this life of crime and now at the end where you're gonna face some real hard time you suddenly want to come into a civilian like that's not cool man especially for somebody like a young fuck who's so beloved and stuff i just feel like that's such a it's such a sad way for him to kind of go out in that respect that he's basically being betrayed by the people he maybe trusted the most and who he thought maybe more of outside the industry the probably people he f he probably thought he could really depend on and now at the moment of need they're all kind of kicking him essentially and sort of con condemning him to a life behind bars for a very long time now i don't see him getting out in a for ever really considering what they're kind of accusing him of, of. um many hits many actual murders um you know actual kingpin stuff not like he was pretending and larping to be the head hot honcho he is legitimately was the head from what we can see so far i don't know i feel sad for the guy man but um hopefully it doesn't involve anyone innocent because if it does then you know can't feel too sad for him but from what i can see it's just gang stuff and gang members deciding to get cold feet and suddenly get conscious when their freedom is at risk when really you should have been thinking about it all along before you joined the gang in the first place isn't it mate but hey who am i to say who am i to say and then i went to end it on this i think most of you have seen this already but this is a post curse of the shade borough and it features this one girl who went on a bit of a social media tear deciding to share a story oh, whoops to share a story about her being flewed out by drake and the internet went into a bit of a tizzy about it all and most of the reason why I went to teach you about it, aside from a girl deciding to go and air out somebody's you know personal business, was the fact that the internet decided that this girl wasn't attractive enough for Drake, that somehow Drake could do better than her, and that she was obviously um, capping because she's not hot or not conventionally hot in their eyes, that it couldn't happen in any way, shape, or form. So I'm going to play a bit of what she said, and I'm going to give you some of my commentary near the end. Mom, Drake had flew me out. So I have made a video and I posted it on my Instagram story. It was a video of me inside a purple lingerie set. And I had tagged Drake inside my story, but I tagged him and I like made it real small so nobody could know that I had tagged him in my story. So I did not know that he was going to even seek it. I'm not even going to lie. 
So he had texted me in vanish mode and was like, what's your number? With the hard eyes emoji. So I sent my number quick. So he called my phone. We chopped it up or whatever. And that's when he was like, he trying to see me. And I was like, I'm trying to see you too. So he had booked my flight for the November 16th. Mind y'all, we texting, talking, all of that, November 13th. So fast forward, I got off the plane. He had sent a private out to get me. But before I went inside his house, they made me sign an NDA. So I can't really say too much, but I had looked at my NDA rules, so I know what I can and can't say. You feel me? So when I get in the house, we just sitting on the couch, chilling, talking. He kept on rubbing. So last month, Drake had flew. So you can tell what the story is going to be. But one of the things that really made me laugh about this whole affair was that there were scores, hordes of men frothing at the mouth, trying to argue the case that this girl wasn't hot enough to fuck Drake, which is legitimately the most gay thing i've ever heard in my entire life like guys legitimately arguing about another man's dick it's like really this is your life this is what you're actually doing and it kind of makes me think of the whole like manosphere in general because there is this vibe or this kind of air of uh, machismo misogyny confidence arrogance that those guys have where they legitimately think that just because they've got a couple of dollars in their pockets, it means that suddenly girls who probably would, the only girls they probably would have maybe attracted if they didn't have any dollars in their pocket are suddenly girls that should never even breathe the same air as them now they have a couple of dollars in their pockets. It's really bizarre because if anything, the money should prove that to be incorrect because if you're somebody that you know is generally unattractive to females to the point where you know even if you don't have money people aren't attracted to you then you suddenly get money and you're attracting the hottest girls in the world it should tell you that they're only there for the money so if a quote-unquote regular girl comes at you you can't then get on your high horse and act like she's beneath you and doesn't deserve your time because essentially that is the only girl you would have attracted when you didn't have any money in the first place when it comes to this girl in particular, I don't necessarily, again, this is just me speaking from experience and knowing how much guys lie, right? And, you know, growing up in a neighborhood of dudes that would fabricate a lot of their flipping lore, a lot of their origin stories. And this, again, this is pre-social media, pre-real internet snooping and whatnot. And people really, you know, calling people out and capping what this is pre all that. So you can get away a lot of stuff back, back in the day. But I know guys lie a lot when it comes to what they've done, who they've seen, who they've been with, what they hit, blah, blah, blah. People lie so often. I can say with some level of confidence, the majority of men out there, over 60% of them who were trying to attack this girl and act like she's not hot enough for Drake, I legitimately can say the majority of them probably have never been with a girl who's as hot as her. I don't think so. Because they're making it seem like she's a gargoyle and even if she was a gargoyle i'd still argue a majority of them probably haven't been many girls that was hot as well. i don't think they have and it kind of i don't know it kind of is another reason why i can't get down with that whole manosphere scene of guys especially the heavily red peeled ones because for whatever reason they treat girls like the lack of humanity that they have when it comes to dealing with women it may, it may be kind of understandable because I feel like a lot of those dudes were dorks in school, right? They were kind of neeks. They never really got any action. They were never cool. They were never popular. They were never funny. They never had friends. They were kind of outcast. So it's sort of like a little bit, it's not even revenge of the nerds because I feel nerds always have friends. You always find other nerd friends. These are like dudes who kind of felt like entitled to women they kind of didn't understand why the other kind of dudes like oh why is she with her why is she with him he's a loser he's a waste man that kind of like idiot kind of like um player hater type of energy i feel like those type of dudes are the ones who eventually grow up to be like fresh and fit guys right where you're selling courses on how to say hi and bye to women it's nonsense and i've actually thinking about it yesterday i was like i was kind of like um loosely tied to like the old school PUA forums back in the day, right? The PUA scene, the pick up artist scene back in the day. Cause I was always on forums. I kind of just stumbled on it, um, accidentally being on a forum. And then that kind of led me to reading the secret, which is most guys have probably read the Neil Strauss book. And that whole pick up artist scene was mostly about improving yourself as a person. Also a lot of it, there was a lot of stuff about getting your fashion, right? Losing weight, getting haircuts that suit you wearing clothes that you know accentuate stuff on you and make you look better smelling good and also the ability and also the from what i remember anyway most of it was about trying to overcome the fear of talking to women 
that was most of it was about and again the the end goal was about trying to hit as many there wasn't a lot of talk in there about relationships and trying to find the right wife and stuff it did happen with a lot of them a lot of the big PULs end up getting married and whatnot but most of it was all about like self-improvement and also how to overcome the fear of talking to women because no one can deny it but if you're a straight dude trying to talk to girls is really difficult especially if you have no practice no skill no confidence it's really frightening really scary to go up to a stranger that you may think looks attractive and try to you know seduce them in any way shape or form it's just cut you know especially in this era it's just it's hard it's difficult it's difficult so that's what the pick up wise thing was about it's just what it is on a tin try and pick up girls i have a controversial opinion where i legitimately think the manosphere is worse than the pickup artist thing because at least the pickup artist thing it was about trying to improve yourself to be more attractive and also trying to just get over the fear of talking to girls whereas the manosphere thing most of the guys that are at the forefront of it are very unattractive as just humans like it's not not very likable people right you think of fresh and fit you think of andrew tate there's a few others out there, but they're not exactly likable humans. You don't actually want to be their friend. You don't want to go out with a beer with them. I wouldn't imagine. It kind of is fun to be a fan of them because you can be counterculture and kind of, you know, trigger and troll people online, right? It's quite fun. I think in that regard, there's probably some fun in that. But they don't necessarily, I don't know. I don't think of them as cool guys or cool dudes in any way, shape or form. They just get what they get done. But that's the issue for the most part. And it also, I guess, it builds this these guys have like a weird resentment with women and females in general. Now, I don't know what that resentment is all about. Maybe it's because they got rejected so often in school and they feel like now that they're up, that they deserve everything, you know, paid back retroactively in terms of the none. I don't really know, but I feel like all that stuff is incredibly corny, incredibly lame. And if anything is another example as to why it's probably hard out there for a single girl to find somebody that they can settle down with because if these are the guys that they're listening to on a daily, um, you know, that are forming their worldview, um, informing their lifestyle choices and whatnot, it's pretty difficult. The, the pool's going to be pretty shallow for options if those are the guys that they deem to be heroes, like legit. Think about it. Like if you're a girl and you go out to a dude's house and he's got a picture of fresh and fit standing back to back folding their arms, looking into the camera dead eyed with that tism smile you're going to be a bit concerned right you, you should probably run for your life also jump out the window wherever it may be you should probably leave and you know the date probably would have went probably halfway decent and then suddenly he's trying to lecture you on you know uh he's trying to lecture, lecture you on abortion laws on your way back in an uber <laughs> and then suddenly your red flags are going up but i don't know man i thought that whole discourse around it was weird obviously drake played it up with his screenshot never met never spoke never flew i hope people start doing more with their online with their one life we are given the shit is sad out here which is you know understandable if you generally don't know the girl you can definitely see it from that point of view like what are you doing with your time with your life woman why are you make up these stories and again it involves him so he's probably allowed to say what he wants in this regard but i feel like the dudes who don't know the guy who are just fans of his music going out there and really trying to defend drake's d-i-c-k and say that nah he wouldn't have smashed that trust me i know i've smelt it you know what i mean i've touched it like that is real gay shit and those are the same guys who are probably the most homophobic also which is also really interesting <laughs> extremely homophobic but also go out their way to try and defend another man's dsck it's like come on my guy you need to relax and kind of rein it in a little bit but hey who am i to say when it comes to these things who am i to say so big up drake for clearing up and big up her for making up the story and what's the harm in making up a story life is boring life is mundane life is a bit one note it's a bit drab if you want to spice things up a little bit and make things interesting why not make up your story here and there who are you really gonna harm right no one really believes you anyway because you're just some random person not because what you look just some random person talking to a camera why should we believe you i think we should do that more often going into 2023 there should be more skepticism if you just do because you say stuff doesn't mean it happened so people should be looking at you like mm, did it really happen though cool and if you provide evidence cool if you don't whatever but there should be a level of skepticism initially when people say stories but if you just made it up i don't really see the problem in it why not you know make your life some fun you know make fun you know oh sorry make some fun out of your life she probably increase her followers i'm not sure if she her account is open or if it's private probably got loads of followers probably also probably got some decent dms as well people are like saying you know what i would actually hit so let's get to know each other that could also happen 
maybe some brand deals in the background who knows but still just the, the the feeling of being alive for that week is enough already to make people feel like this is worth it and i don't feel like it's just that big of a deal really and truly all things considered that going on out there maybe it's a complete waste of time as Drake is saying hey you get one life on this planet you should be spending it legitimately doing the things that you actually enjoy i think someone like a Drake has probably realized especially reaching the the zenith of popularity that he's currently on and making the money that he's made he's realized that there's not anything else that he needs in life so maybe the one thing that he looks at yeah, and thinks rah man i wish i had more of was maybe time but most rich people are like that right that's why they they're into longevity stuff time is a one non-renewable resource so for sure somebody here's position is thinking about it like, rah man at your young age she's maybe what 25 tops you shouldn't be wasting time to making up fan fiction about me and me and getting flued out that shouldn't be what you're doing but for us watching it regular civilians just laugh and watch the flipping circus act everyone's in this circus drake included they are entertainment just watch and laugh but legitimately arguing that she, she's too ugly for him knowing full well you don't have a single person on your roster, on your collection as Flipping Future would say, that would marry up to her, is really, really, really egregious. Really egregious. Like, you need to look at yourself in the mirror. Wind your neck in a little bit. Relax. Chill out. Like, honestly, Manosphere Ting is absolute washed waste guy and stuff. I'm not happy I'm not involved in any way, shape or form. Don't get me wrong, I'm still a little bit cringed out. I was involved in the PUA scene a little bit. But again, most of it was, you know, reading the, um, what do you call it, the game. Most of it was being, back in the day, I don't know if you remember, I think it was like LFSCC or LGG. I forgot the forum. There's like a UK, if you know, you know. There's like a UK forum for PUAs back in the day that we used to all go on. Back in the day when Miss Shun and those guys were doing their thing. And if you remember, there was like a show, there's a reality TV show about PUAs where they'd be filming guys in nightclubs, you know, CCTV and have microphones on them and, you know, tell them to go and pick, you know, pick up certain girls again. The terms are really kind of triggering nowadays, but just go with me. So I pick up and talk to certain girls. So it was quite interesting to see how that stuff worked in real life, right? How the negging, all that kind of malarkey would work and how to kind of, you know, the attraction sort of thing, the whole, be able to maintain a conversation, all these things that you generally really, or just the first approach, just the flipping breaking of the ice is just hard. So to see that stuff in real time was really illuminating and really insightful. So I loved that. I enjoyed that. I thought it was really cool. But again, it was mostly used as a tool for you to go to approach women. That was it. It wasn't for you to kind of form these really um, toxic and um, horrible views on women in general and basically thinking that they are... Um, you know, um, subservient to you and have these really weird um, entitled beliefs that you are owed this and I'm the prize academic said it's just yuck, 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 yuck. Um, but yeah, what can I do? Big up to her, big up Drake. Happy everything's been sorted out. Happy everything's been sorted out. Anyway, that has been the Excellent Signature episode number 635. Thanks again for tuning into the show. It's been a pleasure to have your company. Um, happy new year as i said before at the beginning of the show hope you do have a great start of the new year hope you do everything you need to do to get the ball rolling i think in the uk it's a bank holiday so you're probably resting and nursing a bit of a hangover so hopefully that goes well for you i tend to like to sip on a bit of orange juice have some chips and munch on those and that usually gets me up and going for the new day some people are a bit different but regards what you end up doing do it well do it kindly do it with good intention and hopefully come tuesday you'll be ready to attack the week and keep it moving but apart from that hopefully see you guys again very soon take care be safe if you're watching this on youtube you'll go for it to black if you're listening via the audio podcast which most of you should be doing as i have my tune of the day on the audio pod every single day so make sure you jump on that you'll hear my tune of the day ha happening right now in the background and i'll see you guys again very very soon take care Peace.